Go ahead. Welcome to the Montana Baptist Church. This is February the 2nd of 2021. We're coming to you live from our home uh, because of the snow that's out there and all of the uh, possibilities of getting someone hurt. And Lord, we just uh, want to keep everyone safe. So we opted to use the technology that we developed back early, about this time last year, uh, when they were wanting to cancel everything and close down everything. But it has worked out well for situations like this, where, you know, rather than risk a fall or an accident from some of our members, we've utilized this as a way to be able to reach out to not only our members, but also to all of you who are joining us via the satellite system, via the uh, computer world, and all of those things which are spreading the gospel. Regardless of what some folks may try to do, the gospel is getting out and going around the world. So if you're joining us from somewhere outside central Pennsylvania, welcome to the Montana Baptist Church this morning. By way of announcements, uh, coming up on uh, February the 15th, will be a congregation meeting. At that time, uh, the year-end reports should be published so that we have something to look at. So if you have yet to turn the year-end report in, get it to Susan Hess as soon as possible. This month is also Love Gift. And we have up front here uh, Love Gift boxes and things like uh, that are available to you. And also our other mission outreach is the expectations so if you have a baby bottle at home uh, or if you would like one uh, get a hold of Jamie and she'll be able to make sure that you get one you fill it up bring it in and we count it combine it with all the others we give you your baby bottle back because it's an ongoing need it's not just for one month like January is uh, sanctity of life month that is a much needed, much needed outreach, and there's expenses for expectations that go year round. And protecting the lives of the unborn and protecting the, the parents of the individuals who are giving birth, helping them along, guiding them, it's a much needed ministry, and that's what it is. It's a ministry. They do not receive any federal or state funding. That way they're able to share the gospel with those who have questions and give them a firm foundation, a base from which to build their lives upon. Praise God for those folks. Now that was... Uh, also we have uh, wise gift cards that are still available uh, in different denomination sizes. See Vaughn, Mary Sue, or Mary Funk. And also, Operation Christmas Child continues. For this month, For the, it's uh, collecting hats, gloves, scarves, uh, bar soap, washcloths, and toothpaste. Or, excuse me, toothbrushes. Toothbrushes. If you would like to donate some of those new items to Operation Christmas Child, which will go out in November, and that'll be here sooner than what we think. <laughs> so... If you donate some of those items, we'll make sure that they get to the uh, proper location for distribution. If there are no other announcements, I do have one. Here, I just happened to look at my notes here and see this. If uh, you're watching at home or if you're a regular member, uh, you may send your, your offerings to the Montana Baptist Church, uh, P.O. Box 110, in beautiful downtown Montana, <coughs> Pennsylvania zip codes. You, you can find it pretty easily. It's 17850. But uh, that's not why we want you to join in. We want you to join in so that you can receive a message from God and how God's powerful words and His Spirit changes lives, heals bodies, restores the broken spirit of mankind, changes lives. And Lord, if, you, if you've ever looked around, you can see there's a lot of, a lot of folks that need some changing. We all need a little bit of dressing up here and there every once in a while. 
We're a work in progress. We're underway. We're in that process called sanctification. And someday soon, someday soon, it's going to be a glorified body. When the trump of God sounds and the dead in Christ shall rise and we who are alive and remain will meet the Lord in the air. Something to look forward to. Amen? Amen. All right. Praise God for that. There's some that grand and glorious hope that awaits the believer, the child of God. All right. That takes care of the announcements and the, that little intro there to, to the Word of God and what it has to offer. Let's now turn to our responsive reading. Our responsive reading this morning is found in the hymnal at uh, 583. It's called A Responsive Attitude. Now it's divided up there kind of odd. So I'll read the, the first sentence and then you can read the, uh, the following one. And then as we get down through it, wherever it says I am, we'll just all alternate positions there for either myself or the congregation. So number 538, responsive attitude. 583. Excuse me, 583. Uh, a little bit backwards. Hennish fetish, I guess they call that. So, this is the answer Job gave to Jehovah. I know that you are all powerful. What you conceive, you can perform. I am the man who obscured your designs with my empty-headed words. I have been holding forth on matters I cannot understand, on marvels beyond me and my knowledge. Listen, I have more to say. Now it is my turn to ask you questions and yours to inform me. I knew you then only by hearsay, but now, having seen you with my own eyes, I retract all that I have said in dust and in dust and ashes I repent. That is Job having a personal encounter with the with the Lord there in, in a time of prayer. He said, I have seen you with my own eyes, not so much the eyes itself, but in his word and in his glory. Okay, let's uh, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity this morning to worship and to praise you. We praise you, Lord, because you are worthy. You are indeed our King, our Savior, and our soon-coming Lord. Lord, we would just ask that those who are with us this morning via the computer system or, or in however they're joining us, may they receive a blessing from you. May they know and sense that your presence is real in their lives. Father, we would just ask that you would lift up each and every one of us, that we would have a responsive attitude geared towards you. May we see you, and may we see folks that we come in contact with the way that you see them. Whether they be saved or a sinner, they're a soul. And Lord, some of the souls that we encounter need a, an, an encounter with you. Lord, may we be the instruments that bring about that encounter, a, a kind word, a shared thought, and Lord, that may lead someone to you. Lord, we pray for our nation. Lord, we would just ask for divine intervention for all of those folks that lead our great country. Lord, bring about a sense of unity and a sense of reconciliation, reconciliation and unity only towards you. True reconciliation and true unity is when we all speak that you are Lord and you are Savior. Lord, bring about that caliber of love that you showed on Calvary for each and every one of us. Lord, we pray for the church, the church, the big church, the overall, the worldwide church. May we see your hand moving and shuffling things into place that we can recognize and realize that your word which cannot lie, will come to fruition. And Lord, be with this world. Keep it safe. Spread the gospel. May your missionaries and churches throughout the world proclaim your truth and hold fast to it. And Lord, we just ask these things in your precious name. 
Amen. And amen. At this time, we'll have Jamie come up. Uh, she's going to lead us in a couple of songs. I'm just going to turn it over to the one side because the first one we're going to do is for the children. So get ready, or maybe any adult that wants to come along. You know, since it's snowy out and I'm kind of moving slow this morning, I think we need to do Father Abraham. Father Abraham, a man you done. Calisthenics is number one, Majesty. Majesty. This song has a very special place in my heart uh, for many, many years now, like about 20 plus years. So Jamie will come and lead us in this great song, this great hymn of worship, Majesty. Okay, we don't have the organ today, so we're going to do it a cappella, okay? Ready? Majesty. Worship his majesty unto Jesus be all glory, power, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raised. So exalt. Lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Praise God for that song. Flow from his throne down to his own. That's you and I, folks. Throw that blessings that come from God himself. All right. 
Jamie will now come into the scripture for this morning. Okay, Ron is going to Daniel this morning, or rather the Lord has led him to Daniel 1. Daniel 1, if you want to get your Bibles and read along. And then if you have them open, you can have them for the, for the message too, to follow along. And it starts with Daniel 1. Daniel 1, 3 to 9. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine that he drank and three years of training for them. So that at the end of the time they might serve before the king. Now among them were the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief gave the eunuchs of the eunuchs gave the names. He gave Daniel the name of Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel unto the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. May God add his blessings to this reading. What? As she prepares her music, we're going to be turning number to number 580. Who is on the Lord's side? Are you on the Lord's side this morning? If so, say amen. Amen. A little louder there, couldn't hear it. <laughs> yeah, all right, I know there's some out there who's on the Lord's side. So, that's great. Now we're going to sing about it. Number 580. Who is on the Lord's side? And again, no organ, so stay with me <laughs> or go off. Who is the same words. But for love 
sits on the throne. This morning's passage comes from the book of Daniel. Daniel, as you know, is he and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were taken captive on the first deportation. And what struck my heart was the fact that the things that were happening with Daniel you know, he didn't want to be there. You know, he and his friends were taken captive because of corrupt and evil leaders. You can read about that back in, in 2 Kings. And you can see where Pharaoh come up out of Egypt and overrun Jerusalem and Judah. And then for a short time, then after they were in charge. They had a wicked leader who, whose name was mentioned right there in the very first portion of the scripture. That uh, his name was Jehoiakim. But his real name was Eliakim. And you can read that back in 2 Kings. He, his father had brought forth a great reformation. There was so much evil and so much debauchery happening within the town and within the nation of, of Judah. Pharaoh came in and took it over. Pharaoh came in and took it over, and when he, he changed uh, Eliam's name and changed it to Jehoiakim, that was a sign of submission. And what he did to the nation of Israel and to the people of Jerusalem and the surrounding communities is somewhat unfathomable. This is what he did. You can read about it over there in, in uh, again, back here in 2 Kings verse chapter 23. I challenge you to read that passage of scripture, 2 Kings chapter 23. It's a real eye-opener. And you could almost like hold the newspaper here and hold the, the Word of God here and it's hard to tell the difference. You see, Jehoiakim, after he gave in to the Pharaoh of Egypt, gave him all the silver and gold to the Pharaoh. But then he taxed the land and gave the money according to the, uh, the command of the Pharaoh. He extracted the gold and silver from the people, people of the land, from everyone according to his, his assessment, to give it to Pharaoh. He took it all away. Took away all the resources of the nation, and then extracted more out of the people by taxing them to death. Wow. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is speaking of Jehoiakim. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet he was the leader. He was the leader of Judah. But here, because of that, because of that evilness, because of his lust for power, and all of the things that were, oh my word, I encourage you to read 2 Kings. 
But what took place after that was, okay, Pharaoh and Egypt had control over Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Well, guess what? Nebuchadnezzar, up there a little bit to the, to the east of Jerusalem, he decided he wanted that land. You see, that land has been squabbled over for centuries. But I'm telling you on good authority that there's coming a time when there will be peace in that land. Amen. There will be peace for a thousand years. And then there will be a small skirmish. And then there will be peace in that land throughout the whole world for all eternity. When King Jesus sets on the throne. In right. Jerusalem, D.C., David's capital. Praise God. Yeah. Isn't that something to look forward to? Yeah. No more do we have to worry about sending our, our strongest and our finest off to war somewhere in some forsaken place to fight yet another battle or conflict. The conflict is over. The victory has been won, That's and right. it was won at Calvary. That's right. Jesus shed one drop of his blood was enough to defeat Satan and all the demonic foes of hell. You see, Daniel and his friends got taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. Taken back to Babylon. You know, they always send the best. And then it was just... There were, I don't know how many captives... The scripture doesn't say. But these young men, the king ordered the Espinez to the master of the eunuchs that he should take from the king's seed and of the princes. He wanted the best. He wanted the best. And what he would do is he would take them and the master of the eunuchs, which meant that those individuals had lost their ability medically or physically, to reproduce. So that's the case. These young folks, these young men, uh, resources say that they could be been between 10 and 11 years old, oh up goodness. to as high as 16, 17, or and one commentary says they could have been as age of 20. Oh my. They were taken, brought into the temple, brought into the, to be schooled, you see, the children, of whom were of no blemish, were well favored and skillful, skillful in all wisdom concerning knowledge and understanding science, and had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace, where he might teach them, teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. In other words, brought them in. Going to educate them. And the reason for the losing their ability to reproduce is because to cut down on, on any threat to any of the surrounding fair maidens. So they were sent to this school by the master eunuch to teach them these things. Now there was four of them that were mentioned here in the book of Daniel. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These four individuals placed in a predicament into a situation which they had no control over. It was they had no control because of what their leaders done. So they were, they didn't cry, oh, we're a victim here, you know. They didn't say, oh, it's because of this or that, you know. You can't do this. But what being taken into a foreign land, being taught foreign lifestyles, being taught all these things which were objectionable to what God had emplaced upon their hearts, Daniel, and I would have to say along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the other three, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. In other words, he's taken a stand. You can put me here. You can make me try to eat the king's food or drink the king's wine. You can teach me all this stuff. You can change my name from Daniel 
which means the judgment of God, God's judgment. You can change it to Belshazzar, which means a worshiper of Baal. You can do all of that stuff. You can change my name. You can change my diet. You can change what I drink. You can change how I think. But you can't take what's in my heart. Amen. You can't steal that away. And that's what I'm standing on. I will not defile that which has been imprinted on my heart, given to us from the law, the prophets, and, uh, and all of the imprints that the Word of God, God made on Daniel and these three individuals. They wouldn't change. They wouldn't bow at the knee. They wouldn't bow over when the, when the king made a, a graven image out in the plains and said, when the music plays, everybody must bow down. Not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They never bowed to the knee at the king's edicts. You know, what was taking place with the master of the eunuchs, he was to teach them. He was to make them good little minions, full of knowledge and wisdom and say things that the king wanted to hear. I'm not going to eat your food that was appointed to them daily. Meat and wine. Meat there means not just flesh, but food. And wine. Wine which was to be, the wine which he drank. In other words, he being the, the king. And if he refusing to set it at a table where someone has offered you something, especially if they're in a position of authority, or my grandmother, when she set that food before you, and if you kind of turn up your nose, she would say, what, my cooking not good enough for you? Of course, he always made enough for uh, an, army. an army. I guess she got that habit when she worked as a cook in a lumber camp. But, you know, her cooking was always good. I never turned my nose up at anything, and I tell you what, she cooked with lard, and she cooked with onions, so her food was always good. But here, we see that these fellows decided, nah, we're not going to take your, your food, which was offered to idols. We're not going to drink your wine, which was offered to idols. We're not going to, we're going to eat what has been given to us by the Levitical law. We're, that's what we're going to eat. We're not going to eat your other stuff. And what there's a notation here about the special wine that the king ate, or excuse me, the king drank. It was offered to Baal. And drinking this special wine was supposed to enhance their understanding and their intelligence. Oh boy. Huh. I've been in situations like that. You either got an idiot or an intellect. All you got to do is just add alcohol. Huh. And it's amazing, after you've drank enough of it, them beer muscles just, you know, make you do things that you really wouldn't do. Then pay for it later on. But here, we see that they changed their names. They tried to erase their culture. They tried to erase their dietary needs. They, in today's standard and terminology, we would call that they were trying to cancel culture. Make you think something that's not the way that it is. But Daniel and the others purposed in their hearts that they would not defile themselves. question comes up. What sustained them? What brought them to that point where they wouldn't bow at the knee? They wouldn't give in. They wouldn't compromise. It has to do with their upbringing. They were taught from little on. They, the scriptures that were read, the first five books of the Bible, the instructions of the Levitical law, 
of what to eat and what not to eat and what to stay away from and what to eat and what's, what's safe. Those things were ingrained in them from little on. It's the same, same picture that we get when the Apostle Paul in his second, in second Timothy, his letter to Timothy says, I saw that same thing in you, Timothy. You got it from your grandma, Lois, who got it from your mother, Eunice. Or do I have it the other way around? Either way, you get the idea. It was ingrained in them from grandma to mother to Timothy. How many of you here this morning can say, praise God, I have a, a, a loving mother, a God-fearing mother, or a God-fearing grandmother that instilled in me the stories and the evidence of a, of a righteous and holy God in their lives and transferred that into the hard hearts at such an early age. Praise God. Praise for God. Praise God. You see, they wanted to change Daniel. They wanted to change these other lads that were there too. But what sustained them, what kept them grounded, what was the word of God, first of all, that they knew that they were those, God's word was yes and amen. But it was also their prayer. The written word, prayer, they didn't have the written word with them. They probably they couldn't take it along. So what they had as far as was in their heart. The written word, prayer, and listening to what God has to say in the, when he answers those prayers. Be still and know that I am God. You see, that's what sustained them. That's what kept them on course. That kept them their foundation firm. It, they did not allow that to be shaken. They did not allow this, the winds and the test of time and all the things that were being thrown at them to destroy their foundation. Wow. You know, we see our foundations sometimes crumbling, cracked. Are they strong? Well, the Bible says, you know, the two houses, one was built on the rock, the other was built on the sand. What happened? The one that was built on the sand, when the winds and the waves, the adversity of the, of, of the weather come along, and that we can apply that to our hearts and our, to our lives, the adversity of, of the, the things that come along, our foundation is washed away because it's not very firm. It's built on shifting sand. But those foundations that are built on the rock, oh, built on the rock, on precious, on Jesus, the precious rock I stand, all other things are sinking sand. It was those foundations, their obedience to the word of God, their prayer life, which, by the way, Daniel got in trouble for praying. Huh. He got in, in trouble. He didn't get in trouble. But you know, because Daniel and the others excelled in their educational process, because they were above all the others, they were given more responsibility. And as they grew in age and they grew in responsibility, others saw the potential that they had and were given them positions within the Babylonian, the king's government. And guess what happens? You have individuals whom are jealous. Why did they pick this, this Hebrew boy over me? How come he got the position of, of, of a, an ambassador over the a particular area over me? They were Individuals were struggling with jealousy, that big green monster. They were political rivalries and to the extent that they would go to shame that individual in this case it was Daniel these individuals went to the went to the king and said you know that guy Daniel you know he prays numerous times a day looking out the window 
facing Jerusalem. Of course, you know how that unfolded. Daniel got called into the king's court and said, Daniel, do you pray? Yeah. So that sentence made him go to the lion's den. They were figuring, ah, oh, those ones, oh, we got him now. He'll no longer be an ambassador. We have won. Have you ever seen that picture of Daniel when they lowered him down in the pit full of lions? You know, I've seen it. You know, you would think that he'd be down there looking everywhere he could. But the best picture I've seen of Daniel in the, surrounded by these ferocious kitty cats, he's looking upward. He's looking up. You know, he's praising God, praying that he would be saved. And that goes along the same line when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when the king elevated himself and set up this big statue out on the plains, that when the music played, everyone was to bow down to the statue, in, an, in a sense, giving tribute to the king. And if you didn't bow down, again... That was a, a direct offense against the king himself. Punishable by death. Well, when the music played, these three Hebrews didn't bow down. Of course, quick they went, they went to, the, uh, to the king and said, Oh, you know those other three guys? They didn't bow down either. So the king brought them in played the music, and they didn't, everybody else bowed down, and they're standing there. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where you might be the only believer in a crowd of a, who knows how many. You may be the only one that takes a stand. You may be the only one that has the courage to stand. There was a young lady that was attending a prestigious college in Texas. And you know when you send your children and your grandchildren off to some of these secular schools, they have a devious plot is to strip an individual who goes there with a the belief in Jesus Christ and the truth that he is. They want to strip that away from them. Well, this individual, this young lady, was in this class, and the the professor gave a, a tray, a long speech, totally dis debunking and trashing the gospel and supposedly using science as an excuse and as evidence. And after the end of his long lecture, he says, if there's anyone here that still believes that there is a God, Stand up. There was one young lady stood up in the back of this tip, back of the, the hall. And when she stood up, she began to sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the Lord. And then another one stood up. And then another one. And then another one. You see, sometimes it only takes one individual to make a stand where others are so afraid, but you're not alone. And I want to tell you straight out, you on God's side are a majority. You on God's side are a majority. It's not the other way around. You know, God's not on my side. I'm on his side. And the victory is already won. So here we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego failing to bow to the knee. And of course, that meant certain death. King says, fire up that furnace. Get it good and hot. Seven times hotter than normal. Now, as most of you know, in my other world, I would have to think, how in the world would you get a furnace that hot? Because, of course, the ones I work on aren't designed to go over particular rating other than something massive is going to happen and you don't want that to happen. But anyway, they bound 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said, bow down. And the answer that, that these three individuals get, these three people, these three lads, regardless of how old they were, they said to King, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king now, the individual has power over life and death over these folks. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We don't need to think about this. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand. O king, but if not, but if not, let it be known to you that we do not serve your gods. They stood right there and said, if he saves us, fine. If we perish, fine. We'll be in the presence of our Lord. But we will not serve your gods. Wow. They wouldn't bow down. They wouldn't compromise. They wouldn't join in in solidarity. They purposed in their hearts that they would remain true to their salvation, which is found only in Jehovah, God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, it's faith that overcomes the world. It's faith that brings our victory. It's our relationship with God that provides the instruction, that it provides the reinforcement each and every day. And that relationship during prayer. And we wait on the answers. We wait for those answers that will give us the guidance and the, that which is needed. Sometimes it's just very quick. Other times we might have to wait a little bit. But God always answers the, ch the, the prayers of those that know Him. Sometimes it's We ask for prayers for loved ones, loved ones who are sick, loved ones who are, you know, in dire straits. You know, we as siblings, friends, and loved ones, we want to hang on to our those that we know and love as long as we can. We pray for healing for someone who's really sick, regardless of the situation. And that individual passes away. Well, in a sense, our prayers have been answered. Yes, we miss that individual. There's a void in our life. There's a hole in our hearts. But that individual who knows Jesus Christ is healed. No longer, no longer do they have to suffer with all the results of the sin-filled world and the diseases that come with that. The deterioration of the body, the deterioration of our frames, they're healed. Forever, not just for a season, not for just three score and ten, as Scripture says, but forever, for all eternity. Do you believe that? Do we believe that? Daniel and these other ones these young folks that were there made a statement that they wouldn't bow at the knee. They purposed themselves in their hearts. And that's where it starts. When we know in our, our hearts that when we sing, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. He did it for Daniel. He did it for Shadrach. He did it for... Meshach and Abednego. He did it for Moses. He did it for Joshua. What makes us think that he won't do it for us? There is no reason 
God's promises are yes and amen. And they will come true. Praise God. You see, that's what made these three young men suffer the psychological torment, the medical, physical torment that they went through. But it didn't change their standing before a righteous and holy God. Praise God. Each of us, as we look at this particular passage of Scripture, may we ask ourselves, if put into a situation similar to that, or maybe not as dramatic, facing death, but in a situation where, do I say something? Do I join in? Or do I say nothing at all? And sometimes silence is a way of, of agreeing with what's being said. We need to stand. Stand on the Lord's side. Some of the places that he puts us, we don't know. God knows. But when he calls, when we go, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. As did Daniel and the others. And countless folks across the centuries, across the myriads of time, have brought us to this point for such a time as this. There is a need. And we are the instruments that God has chosen to bring forth his peace and his security and his love. Praise God. Join us now. Number 578. I'll go where you want me to go. It may Oh! 
join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come to you this morning knowing that we are worshiping you. You, Lord, are the audience and we are the participants. Lord, your word is true and it rings in our hearts and in our ears. May we be that person that stands firm, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that regardless of what comes along, I shall not be moved. I'm standing on your promises, which are yes and amen. And Lord, we thank you for each and every promise, each and every blessing. And Lord, we would just ask that you would be with each of us till we gather together next Lord's Day or till we meet you in the air. You are our God. There is no other. The name that is above all names is the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hope to see you next week in our sanctuary.